Hey everyone, welcome to your deep dive. Mm. Ever get that like urge to just get away from something you just don't want to do? Totally. Or like how we learn stuff without even realizing it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, today we're tackling those questions. We're diving into Cooper Chapter 12, all about negative reinforcement. That's dense, right? Full of insights, though. We'll unpack it all. Our mission, decode negative reinforcement. Lose the jargon. Bring in those real-life examples so everyone gets it. And trust me, it's way more common than you might think. Like, everywhere. For sure. Okay, the chapter starts by going for a big misconception people have. What's the difference between negative reinforcement and punishment? Because they both sound kind of, well, negative. Right, they do. But the key is what happens after you do something. Negative reinforcement is when you do something more because it makes something bad go away. Punishment makes you do something less because something bad gets added. So it's not about good or bad. But if something gets added in or taken away. Exactly. Like imagine you have a splitting headache. So you pop a pain reliever, takes that headache away, right? Next time the pain hits, you're going to reach for that pill again. That's negative reinforcement. Makes sense. But besides popping pills, how's this work in real life? Okay, picture this. You're in a super quiet meeting and your phone starts blaring. Awful. Right. So you instantly silence it, escape those stairs. Oof, I've been there. The worst. And because silencing your phone stopped that awful ringing, you're more likely to do it again. So we're learning all the time from this negative reinforcement, and we don't even know what's happening. Totally. Now, the chapter digs into two main types, escape and avoidance. Okay, hit me with it. What's the difference? So escape is when something bad's already going down and you react. Avoidance, you stop it before it even starts. Imagine a rat in a cage, right? When a light flashes, the rat gets a little shock. It learns to press a lever, light goes off, no more shock. Escape. Gotcha. So what about avoiding it? Now they add a sound before the light. Rats learn, right? Here's the sound. No shocks coming. Bam. Hits the lever. Light never even turns on. So it's like learning to dodge the problem entirely? Yeah. That's wild. Any real life examples of this escape and avoidance stuff? Oh, yeah. Tons. The chapter talks about this study by Azarin and his crew back in 68. Wanted to see if they could get people to improve their posture. Had them wear a device. Clicked when they slouched. Wait, so like a little posture police on their back? Yep. If they didn't straighten up after the click, <laughs> loud, annoying tone. So they built in both escape and avoidance, turning off that tone by sitting up, escape, but staying upright to avoid the click in the first place, mm. avoidance. That's clever. Use the click to avoid the worst sound, like doing chores before your parents bug you about it. Exactly. And what's cool is this study used both types. Straightening up after the click, but before the tone. That's discriminated avoidance reacting to that specific cue. So it's not just getting away from what's happening, but you learn to avoid it based on these little signals. Smart. Exactly. And that shows how nuanced this negative reinforcement thing is, how effective it can be. Makes me think about all the times I put off work just to avoid the stress of starting. Well, that brings up a good point. It's not always physical stuff like pain or loud noises. Past experiences, what we've learned individually, that plays a huge role too. So what bugs one person might not phase another. Yep. Chapter gives this example of someone biking home. They see dark clouds up ahead. Now, the clouds themselves aren't bad, but mm -hmm. this person, they've learned dark clouds, probably rain. Rain means a miserable wet ride. So they've linked those clouds with something bad, and now they're going to start pedaling faster to stay dry. Exactly. And this is where it gets really interesting because these learned associations, conditioned negative reinforcers, they're called, they can drive a ton of our actions. Like think about nagging, deadlines, even just someone disapproving of you. Not physically painful, but we avoid them because we've linked them with bad experiences. So we're talking like th that feeling when you see a stack of bills hmm. or that urge to just grab your phone when you're feeling awkward. It's kind of wild when you realize how much we avoid stuff. Totally. And knowing about negative reinforcement, it changes how we think about learning, about how we change people's behavior. Big implications there. The chapter, it goes into some real world stuff. And one that got me was about kids who just won't eat. Yeah, chronic food refusal, right? That's where knowing this stuff really helps people figure out how to help. Ahern's work and then Piazza too back in 96 and 2003, they found these kids often learned that refusing food, it got them out of meal times. Like the whole situation was just too much. So even if it meant missing out on good food, just escaping, that was more important. Exactly. Once therapists understood that, they could try things to make mealtime better, using positive reinforcement, encouraging kids to try new stuff. It's like you got to look beyond just what you see them doing. I've got Figure out the why. 
hundred percent. And it's not just picky eaters. The chapter, it talks about how negative reinforcement shows up in schools, too, with kids acting out. Yeah, I can see that. Kids being disruptive. Maybe they just want to get out of a boring lesson or a worksheet that's too hard. Right. And if it works, even just for a little bit, they're going to do it again. This reminds me of something else from the chapter O'Reilly's study, 1995. Found that even just being tired, sleep deprived could make work seem way worse made people more aggressive. Oh, that's a good one. Shows how important it is to think about everything that might be going on with someone. What looks like bad behavior might be totally understandable depending on the situation. So how do we use this knowledge in a good way? Like how do we take negative reinforcement and build better learning for everyone? That is the question, right? And the chapter gives us some clues. One big one is swapping out the bad behaviors for good ones. Instead of just saying, don't do this, we actually teach them what to do. Exactly. There's some really neat research on this. Durand and Carr, back in 87, found that if you teach students to just ask for help, instead of acting out, that those bad behaviors, they go way down. Makes sense. You give them a better way to get out of that tough spot, a way that's cool with everyone. Right. And it's not enough to just give them the tools. Those tools got to work. Marcus and Vollmer, 1995, they found that actually rewarding kids with breaks when they did what they were supposed to, that was way more effective than just letting them say they were done. So setting them up for success, not just helping them avoid stuff. Absolutely. And here's another thing, negative reinforcement. It's not just about the student or the kid, right? Yeah. The teacher, the therapist, they're affected too. Oh, okay. How so? Think about it. When a teacher tries something, some new technique, and it actually works, the student's behavior improves. That teacher, they just got a break from whatever that behavior was. Like if a kid stops acting out, the teacher gets to actually teach. That feeling of relief, that would be pretty powerful, right? Exactly. That feeling, it can be a huge negative reinforcer. The teacher is way more likely to use that same strategy again because it worked so well. Wow. So it's like this whole hidden system, a feedback loop almost. Yeah. The teacher learns through negative reinforcement just like the student because of what happens after they do something. Exactly. And this isn't just some theory. There's research. Miller, Lerman, Fritz, back in 2010, then Thompson, Bruzek, and Cottonmore Bishelman in 2011, showed how caregivers responded to a pretend baby crying. If what they did made the crying stop, they'd do it again, even if it wasn't the best way to handle things in the long run. That's incredible. It's everywhere. This negative reinforcement shaping how we interact all the time and we don't even realize it. Makes you think, huh? It's like this whole hidden language influencing how we behave. Mm. And it just shows how important it is to pay attention to really get these concepts so we can use this knowledge to build better learning environments for everyone. I'm with you there. But even though negative reinforcement can be really useful, we got to talk about the ethics of it too, right? Especially when we're using it on purpose, like in therapy. It's like that saying, right? Great power, great responsibility. We got to be careful with this stuff. Totally. Just because we can use it doesn't mean we always should. Got to think about the downsides, too. So, yeah, like, obviously we shouldn't be using any punishments that are actually harmful. Yeah. But it's more than that, right? We have to think about what might happen that we don't expect. Exactly. The chapter talks about this kid who's always being criticized, right? And instead of learning to do things differently, they just kind of shut down, avoid everyone to get away from those negative vibes. It's like trying to fix one thing can make something else even worse if you're not super careful. Behavior is complicated. It really is. That's why you got to be thoughtful, understand what's really going on with the behavior, and then find ways to help that are positive and supportive. That's how you get real change. Well said. This has been eye-opening, for sure. Negative reinforcement is not just a fancy term from a textbook. This stuff is happening all the time, in everything we do, even in how we connect with each other. And yeah, it can be a super useful tool, but you got to know what you're doing and use it ethically. Any last thoughts before we wrap up? You know, I just hope everyone listening to this feels empowered knowing this stuff. It gives you power. We can use it to make better learning environments for ourselves, for our kids, everyone, really. Love it. Okay, time for our lingering question, the one that'll keep you thinking long after we're done here. Today's question is, think about your day, your routine. How much of it is you just trying to avoid something? What could you do? What could you achieve if you stopped escaping and started embracing things instead? Something to chew on. Until next time, keep those deep dives going.